come to God's house. It's not a chore. It's not a, it's not a drag to come in. I know that a lot of times we're working hard during the day and doing all kinds of crazy things and moving and doing all kinds of stuff. But, you know, thank God. Huh? Amen. It, we're not in China. If we're in China, you can't get into church. You can't have an open meeting like this. In some of the places that I went to, we had underground, underground churches we had to meet secretly and uh, in people's homes. And if the police find out, uh, just for having a Bible is an automatic two-year sentence in jail. So, you know, you, how many got your Bibles with you tonight? You know, you came freely. Nobody bothered you, right? No, nobody stopped you. You know, but so thank God we can come in God's house. Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Good to have everyone here. Um, I had some papers. I got them over there. Okay. I um, want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. Good to have you with us tonight. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm just excited that God is about to do some great things. Oh, that was weak. Come on. Amen. God's going about to do some great things. Hallelujah. And I'm excited about it, and I know that uh, we're going to be a part of it. Amen. And so uh, we just got to keep on plowing, keep on plugging, and not give up. You know, one of the hardest things is, and I tell this to people, especially when they want to go in ministry, and everybody wants to be a pastor, I say, you don't know what you're in for. <laughs> but I want to take a moment just to say, you know, Brother Tom is with us tonight. He surprised me. You know, God bless you, brother. You know, uh, he had some problems, and uh, I said, well, he's probably still at the hospital, but uh, I'll probably go and see him tomorrow, but I don't have to. He's here now. Praise God. So I don't know what, how much he had to bribe the doctor to let him go, but, but he's here tonight. And God bless you. We love you. We, have, we, we send prayers out all over for you. And uh, thank God, no repercussions. All right? He's normal. Okay? Well, as far as what, you know, uh, what Annie told me, but, uh, but praise God. And so we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. It's good to have you. Also good to have Brother Joe with us now that he works a new job. Hallelujah. You know, and he, he's coming, and uh, we're just praying that uh, the next step for him is God to baptize him in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Put him on fire in, in the name of Jesus. Praise God. Amen. All right. Well, if you have your, if you have your Bibles, I believe we're going to be on the Christocentric principle of hermeneutics. <clears throat> And um, um, I'm excited that God is doing some great things. I, I just, I'm just excited. I woke up 3 o'clock the other morning, and uh, uh, I, I kind of woke up to a hurricane, but that was all right. Uh, 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 and uh, if you want to know about it, I'll tell you about it later. Um, but uh, while I was awake, God started speaking to me. It started showing me things about his greatness. And I was just in awe, and I was just laying, and I was just praising him and thanking him. And I said, God, you are so awesome. You are, you are so out, so great. You know, I was just excited. And then before I knew it, it was 5 o'clock. And then I, I closed my eyes for a little bit, and then uh, Linda got up to go to work. And I woke up and, you know, got up with her and, and prayed with her. And uh, we pray every morning. And uh, I, I think this has been on for a good couple of years now. There's not a single day that goes by that we don't pray for Kathleen. Every single day we pray. And, and for some other, other ones that God has put on our hearts in the morning, we pray for them, for God to um, bless them. Amen? So um, let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for the freedom to come to this place. Thank you for the freedom that we can hold this Bible up, that, Lord, we can, we can preach from your word, God, and we can come to church, God, and Lord, you're so great, you're so great, and we so love you, Father, that, God, you have allowed us to have a ministry here in New Bedford. Thank you for these church members. Lord, many of them are tired, but they still came out, and it shows their dedication and commitment to you. I thank you for that, Lord. Uh, I, I never thought there would be a person that would sit and listen to my preaching, but, God, they've been faithful, and, God, I don't know if it's because... Uh, they love me or because they just don't, don't know a good preacher when they hear it. But uh, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. The Christocentric principle, what in the world is that? What in the world is that? Well, 
The Christocentric principle of biblical interpretation is that principle by which the interpretation of a certain verse or passage in Scripture is aided by an underlying awareness that the central theme of the entire Bible or the entire Old and New Testament is Christ the Messiah. And we're going to see that. I'm going to have you show you some different points that we're going to see that. So this principle is sometimes also called the Messianic principle. Um, the Messianic principle where you can go through Genesis all the way through Revelation and you can find a, a, what's called the, uh, the threat of redemption. You can see through all of the Old Testament Christ. You can see it in the different books. You say, well, gee, I, wrote, I read the Old Testament. I didn't see no Jesus there. Well, he's there, believe me. And so we're going to look at that tonight. The entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, is history. It's his story. It's history. He is the, under, uh, he is the unifying theme of the entire Bible. And um, we must understand that in order to understand the word, now I know some people say, you know, God told me I, I just have to believe it, not understand it. Well, the Bible says to get understanding. <laughs> okay, if you read Proverbs, you know, no, what's good to have knowledge and wisdom if you don't know how to apply it? Well, understanding is the ability to apply it. And so, uh, and we don't need to understand all of it, and I can understand that part of it, when no one's going to understand all of it, but we need to get understanding to know the things that God wants us to know. And I believe that uh, if we take our time and we ask the Holy Spirit, and I was in a conversation with someone the other day, and we were, we were discussing Scripture, and, and, and he was telling me that uh, he was teaching on a certain aspect of the Bible, and, and he didn't believe a certain thing that Orthodox Christians believe. And I said, well, what's the test of what you believe? And he thought for a moment, and I said, see, if you're saying that God is telling you something subjectively inside here, it has to line up objectively here. And I said, even if, it, even if there's a scripture, you can find the scripture. If it's, if it's out of context, it's no good. And so that's the, the, the theme that we have to go by. It has to be in context. So, and, and, you know, don't make the scripture say something it doesn't say. Okay, that's very easy to do. You can read something into it and, and say, oh, yeah, that means, no, it doesn't mean that. You just got to take it for face value of how it was written. So anyway. That was free. The entire Bible, both Old and New Testament, is an unfolding of the plan of redemption. You can see it all the way through. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, I believe it was, says, says uh, he, you, uh, you shall bruise the serpent's head and he shall crush your heel. That's, re that's referring to Christ. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna take away the authority of, of the devil, but his heel was going to be bruised. He was going to go through cru crucifixion. So you can see those things. Uh, the entire Bible, both um, Old and New Testament, relates to unfolding uh, of struggle between the two seeds. You're going to see that. There's two seeds that are struggling. And I'm going to ask Bob to put up that graphic for me. I, I have um, placed up there. I hope you can see it. I, I hope it's big enough. Can you see that okay? Okay, good. If you see, always remember, there's, there's God's kingdom and then there's Satan's kingdom. Okay. There's God's way of doing things, and there's the devil's way of doing things. Now, understand, because we I was having another conversation with somebody, and, and, I, and I was sharing with them, and they, was, they were trying to say, well, why can't people see things? Why is it that people sometimes are just so blind? And I said, because of deception. Deception will blind you. Uh, if you want something bad enough, or if you want to do something that you want to do, you will go to the scripture and find every justification to do that thing. And it's wrong. You can't do that. Um, you can't do it if God says no and, and you try to look for scripture that says yes. Okay. Uh, you're, in, you're in dangerous ground. Okay, so let's look at this for a moment. First, you see there's a seed of the woman. We have the children of light. The seed of the serpent is the children of darkness. Not everybody is a child of God. So, I, you know, I know, understand this ecumenical movement that's going on, and, and of course, the New Age, and we're all God's children, and, you know, we all have light, and, you know, we have the 
preachers on TV, you know, with the big churches telling us that, you know, God loves everyone. Well, that's true. He does love everyone in the sense that he sent his only begotten son. But, uh, you know, Paul even talked about enemies to the cross of Christ. There are certain people that are never going to get saved. That's the reality of it. We don't believe in universalism. Universalism teaches that everyone's going to be saved. That's not true. Not every, if that's true, then why did, why did Jesus talk about hell? Why did, Jesus, why did the apostles talk about the lake of fire? There's a place called hell. Come on, somebody. All right? There's a literal hell that's going to be, uh, people are going to be going to, and, and we have to understand that. Not everybody is going to go to heaven. And it's not because God is choosing one above the others because they've chosen to choose not to serve God or to accept the sacrifice that he sent. So you have mystery of godliness, okay? You have a mystery of iniquity. You have the spirit of truth. You have a spirit of error. And I was telling this person, this, I said, you've got to be careful. There is a spirit of error out there. You know, not, not a lot of these revelations that come forward on television is of God, okay? I'm sorry, I don't believe for one moment that God sends gold dust down onto an assembly. I don't believe that uh, God sends gold dust on people. And, and, and uh, now here's a good example of, of bad hermeneutics, okay? Bad example of it, okay? When one of the churches experienced that, the scripture that they used was, well, you know, the Bible says in Revelation, you know, all heaven is paved with streets of gold, and that was the angels jumping up and down, and the dust from the jumping up and down came down to earth. Okay, that's, that, they're liars. They're deceivers. They deceive themselves if they really believe that. So where did the gold, quote, gold dust come from? The gold dust came from the vent system, which means somebody put it there. So whoever put it there knew it wasn't real. But people want to see signs and wonders. But they're lying signs and wonders. Okay? God doesn't need to give people a gold. You know, if, if that was real gold, you know, people would be bringing their buckets. Okay? And they'll be running over to the nearest place that they can uh, exchange that gold for coin, you know, or for some money. You know what I mean? Uh, it doesn't work that way. So, again, so we got children of promise. We have children of the flesh. We got the kingdom of God. We got the kingdom of Satan. We got life. We got death. We got godly seed line. We got ungodly seed line. We got Christ and we got Antichrist. So, you see that there's an unfolding struggle all the way from, from the Garden of Eden. It all goes through all the way to the Bible. And you know what? The Bible says, through much tribulation, we shall enter the kingdom. So you're going to be tempted, you're going to be tried. And you know what? He knows how to tempt people. Okay. Okay. You may not be tempted to do some of the things that, like, like uh, heroin or coke or anything like that, but he's going to tempt you on the little things that seem innocent. But the world does. See, I read the scripture, I think it was Sunday uh, one time before, you know, about uh, be separate, come out from among them, touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. Well, there has to be a separation. I was talking to somebody today, a minister, I think Pastor Mike Kelly, and I was talking with him, and, and we were sharing about Christianity, how different it is today, how it was 20 years, 30 years ago. And, and 20, 30 years ago, the uh, Spirit of God was moving, and, and people were, were packing the churches out. But today, you've got to pull, drag, you know, tie them up almost and bring them to church. You know, and they make every single excuse why not to come to church. And that's sad when people make excuses not to come to church. I mean, this is the place you want to run to. This is your, this is your haven. This is your refuge. This is where you love. This is where people, you know, uh, encourage one another and lift one another up and, and, you know, stuff like that. So what is the biblical pr uh, basis of this principle? The biblical basis of this principle is the testimony we find of Philip in St. John 145. I'm going to ask Brother Bob to put that up there for me, please. John 145.
It says, Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him. Who's him? Proper, proper hermeneutics. Who's him? Jesus, right? It's not a trick question. I'm not trying to fool you. Okay. Okay. We have found him, and you can find it from the context of the scripture, that it's Jesus. We have found him of whom Moses in the law. Now, you know what the law is, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, right? Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Okay. So you know what the law is. And the prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, right? All the minor prophets, all the major prophets, did right. So now that, that's a, that scripture right there validifies that the Christocentric principle runs through the entire Bible. Moses and the law, the prophets, did right. Jesus of Nazareth. So now you know when that, when Philip said he found that Nathaniel, he said to him, okay, I'm sorry, he said to uh, Nathaniel, that him is not Christ, it's Nathaniel. We have found him, the second him. We have found him, Jesus of Nazareth, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, when you read the son of Joseph, okay, now watch now. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought Joseph was a stepfather. Why is it saying that he's the son of Joseph? Right? Because he had no earthly father. So remember what we, we talked about? Scripture, interpreting scripture. You just don't take one scripture and make a, make a doctrine out of it. You've got to make sure all the scripture. So when you go back and you read the accounts, you found that Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Right? And it says Joseph knew her not. Till Jesus was born. So that means that Mary had relationships with Joseph. She wasn't a virgin. And she had other children. Jesus had half brothers and sisters. Okay. But from Genesis to Revelation, it reveals Christ. The Bible, the, bi the biblical basis for this principle is the testimony also of Peter, Acts 10.43. I don't think I'll get through this lesson because it's a big lesson. So we'll have to probably do it in two, maybe two or three. He is the one all the prophets testified of oh and before i go on let me let me stop because i forgot all about this and you thought i forgot didn't you did any of you find a breach in the new testament yeah we have one that did anyone else find a breach well what's the scripture Okay. Right. Well, remember, we're talking about a breach of promise, a promise that was given, and then the promise, there was a breach, and then the fulfillment of that promise. Well, now, now you're kind of out there a little bit. Okay. So, again, a promise given, then a breach for that promise, and then the promise fulfilled. Anybody else find one? Did anybody else look? No? Okay. Yeah, she did. Yeah, I already gave her her kudos on, on online. She found one. 
But I'll, I'll give you one, and, I, and, and this is one that was, I just thought of at the top of my head. Do you remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem and he overlooked Jerusalem and he said these words, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together as the chicks, as a, a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. That's a breach. God made a promise that Israel was to be a light to the nations. Okay? All right? And now the promise is breached. They wouldn't do it. Let me finish. They wouldn't do it. Okay? But then you read Revelation and you see at the end Israel will be saved. You see the fulfillment of the promise. So there is a breach there. Yes, Bob. Right. Okay. I'm not telling you. You have to search it out for yourself. Well, anyway, good. <laughs> All you can do is read the book. You have a syllabus, right? Read the book. <laughs> okay, just read the book. Okay, so let me finish over here. Um, he is the one that all the prophets testify, testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. All the prophets testified about. All of them. Okay. The biblical principle for this, the biblical basis for this principle is the testimony of Jesus. Look at um, Psalm 40, verse 7. Um, Hebrews 10, 7. It says this, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Okay. This scripture right here is one of the test scriptures, okay, for proof of the Trinity. Because some people don't believe in the Trinity. You know, they're Jesus only. And uh, look what it says. Therefore, when he came into the world, that was a process. He was coming in. He wasn't here yet. Jesus was coming in. It says, when he was coming into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. There's another person speaking there, not God. Hello? No, that was Christ. That was the Word. Put the, see, what I'm trying to get you to do is put the scriptures together. Okay, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in 1 John it says that there's three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, it doesn't say Jesus, it says Father, the Word, and the Spirit. And these three are one. Okay, But that's a compound one. It's not one, like you see, one Joseph. Okay. So, again, I don't want to get on the Trinity, but that's what it means. And then he said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, just as it was written about me in the Scriptures. That's uh, Hebrews 10, 7. So Jesus himself says that even the Scriptures speak of who he is. So, again... <clears throat> There's a lot of people that are skeptical. They don't know what they believe. You know, I, I don't know if it's true. Is God true? Does the Bible, is the Bible true? Is that what religion's right, what religion's wrong? 
But if you go through and you think about it rationally, in logic, okay, and you read historians, not even the Bible, but apart from the Bible, historians, it proves who Jesus said he was. So the skepticism really is not founded on any particular factual information. It's just on presupposition, you know, suppositions. It has nothing to do with truth. Okay. So anyway, there are several occasions when Jesus implied that he was connected to the patriarchs of old. Look at Abraham in John 8, 56 to 58. It says this, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. Now, this is Jesus speaking. And he saw it and was glad. And then the Jews said to him, these are the know-it-alls. They were the know-it-alls. You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? You see the misunderstanding there? He was telling them, look, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. How could Abraham, thousands of years before, see his day? Because of what? Yes, because of the promise. And unto thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That seed was not plural, seeds. It was seed singular which means there was one particular one that would come through his lineage, and that is the Messiah, Christ Jesus. So get, get these principles, because these are really, really important of, to, in how to interpret the Bible. He said, are you yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to him, most assuredly, I'm telling you the truth. That's what he was saying. I'm going to give you truth right now. I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You know, when other, when other, I think it was, was it this time or the other time when he revealed who he was, I am, they all fell over backwards because of the power. I am. What does that mean? Jesus was saying he was God. Because you can only have one I am. Amen. Moses in, in uh, John 5 45 to 47, he said this, Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. That's why some people say we don't need the Old Testament. They don't know what they're talking about. We need the Old Testament. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And then David in Matthew 22, uh, two, verse 45, he said, While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Not from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. Okay. And this is seen by Jesus' literal statement in Luke 24, 44, a claim Christ claimed on several occasions that he was the central theme of the Old Testament. You can see that in Luke 24, 27. You got all these scriptures in your book. Uh, verse 44 and John 5, 39. Uh, John 5, 39 says this. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You understand why, you understand why people hate this book? It testifies of Christ. It testifies of their guiltiness. It testifies that they have a responsibility and accountability to God. That's why they hate this book. Amen. They hate this book. Yet it's the number one bestseller. <laughs> okay. 
It's almost like the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible has become like a, a superstitious thing. You put it on your table, you know, to protect your house. Okay. Um, the biblical basis for this principle is the testimony of the gospel writers also. Jesus was constantly affirmed by the gospel writers as the fulfillment of that which was foretold in the Old Testament. Christ indicated that he came to fulfill the law. He was the exact fulfillment of the law. He said, do not think, in uh, Matthew 5, 17 to 18, I'm going to read that. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or not one tittle, those are uh, Hebrew markings, by the way, in the, in the, in the letters to the in letters in the Hebrew, will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So we have God's promise here that everything that was spoken about the Messiah in the Old Testament, okay, including his return, including him standing on the Mount of Olives, it's everything you read in Acts about the return of Christ to the Mount of Olives was all written in Zechariah, I believe it was. Go back in the Old Testament and read Zechariah. And you go, wow. Look at, look at it a little bit differently than just Old Testament, but read it and you'll see. In um, Luke 24, verses 25 to 27, he also said this. Then he said to them, O you foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter his glory and beginning at Moses, now Jesus was doing this, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. So when you, when you read, how many have read the entire Old Testament? Okay, two people, three people. Old Testament. You have? <laughs> oh, that's okay, you don't have to remember it all. But if next, try to get on a schedule to read the Old Testament again. And when you do, though, put on the glasses now and look for those, those, those scriptures that are referring to Christ. And you'll see and you go, wow. When you read about the Passover, when, about the blood of, of the lamb that was shed, he says, you put this on the doorposts. When you put the blood on the doorposts, when the death angel comes, I will pass over you. That's the Passover. Okay? But what was the doorpost? And it's, a, it's a reflection of the cross. When that blood was shed and, and applied on the cross, the death angel has passed over you now. See, because the wages of sin is, but the gift of God is through Jesus Christ. So see, you put that together, you go, wow, that's cool, you know? I get excited about that. I don't know about you. Here, Jesus mentioned that the three main sections of the Bible all speak of him. Jesus said, we cannot comprehend or, to, uh, or understand the scriptures unless we see him in them. So remember that. The biblical basis for this principle is the testimony of the gospel writers also. Jesus was constantly affirmed by the gospel writers as the fulfillment that which was foretold in the Old Testament. Um, if you look at uh, where it says Christ indicated that he came to fulfill the law. You know, when we read that <clears throat> in Matthew, uh, the gospel writers referred often to Jesus' fulfillment of the Old Testament prophets concerning the Messiah who was to come. Isaiah, right? For unto us a child is given, unto us a son is given, unto us a child is born, right? His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, you know, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. Um, you read uh, in Isaiah 53, you know, about, about um, the crucifixion, right? If you read in Isaiah 53, you read about it and think about the crucifixion. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. His chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we were healed. You read that and you, go, and you understand. So here's a thing that you can tell somebody that might be skeptical. How can Isaiah, some almost a thousand years before it happens, 
tell you about someone who was going to die on a cross. See, that's what you have to do. You have to go to the scripture. You have to show them. How can a man who was the Apostle Paul kill Christians? Not only threw them in jail, he killed, he had them killed. Okay? Kill Christians, okay? Have them thrown in jail, have them arrested, have them persecuted them, and then all of a sudden, now is a defender of the faith. How could that happen? If, it, if he knew intuitively that the way or the Christian life was not real, why would he do that? Why would the Apostle Paul have his head cut off for a lie? Why would, why would these disciples get thrust through with a spear, Peter get crucified upside down? Why would they all die a martyr's death if they knew intuitively in their heart that what they believed was not really true? They wouldn't. Believe me, if someone came and broke into your home and had a gun, to, uh, had a machine gun up against your children and said, renounce this Jesus that you have because it's all fake and, and t tell us that it's fake and it's not real or we're going to kill your kids. If you know it's fake and you're faking it, guess what? You're not going to do that. You're going to say, okay, it's fake and it's not real. But if you, if you are really serious and committed to Christ, you're going to say, no, I can't do that because it, he is real and he is a part of my life. Even though as they shoot your children, hello? Why are you all looking at me, staring at me like, huh? It happens. Read the Fox's Book of Mart Christian Martyrs. You can get it online. Read it about testimony after testimony, people that were burnt at the stake because they wouldn't renounce Christianity. And you're going to tell me that all of those people were wrong? No. 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 Christ is real. You know? You know, we sing that song, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. And He walks with me and He talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives, He lives within my heart. <clears throat> Religion can't change you. Okay? And so your testimony is living proof that there is a God. Okay, we don't get on that button here. Okay. So now we're going to look at the Old Testament prophets. What I did was I had some copies made so I, you don't have to go through all of this all these scriptures, because there's a lot. I'm going to read just a couple. I'm going to read through them, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you a copy in a minute. I might not have enough copies, so she might have to take one for family. My wife doesn't need one because we can get it on the computer. Okay? <clears throat> the Old Testament prophesied this. Watch this. Jesus would come on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. I'm going to give you just the Old Testament ones. There would be plots to kill Jesus, Psalm 2.2. 2. Jesus would reestablish the temple as a house of prayer, Isaiah 56, verse 7. Jesus would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Did you know that was in Zechariah 11? Jesus would be smitten and his followers would scatter, Zechariah 13, 7. Jesus would be silent in the face of accusations, Isaiah 53, 7. He opened not his mouth. Excuse me, he opened not his mouth. Jesus would be hit with the palm of their hands, Isaiah 56. Think about this. This is like 800 to 1,000 years before, and they're prophesying that, they're going to, that he's going to be hit with, that, with pe people's hands. They're going to slap him and hit him. How did they know that? That was God's, God's inspiration that told him these prophecies and told him these things to prove that it's real. Amen. Okay. Uh, Jesus would be beaten severely, Isaiah 53. Jesus would be spit upon and have his beard plucked from him, Isaiah chapter 50. Jesus would be numbered among the transgressors, transgressors Isaiah 53, 12. He was, right? There was two thieves on a cross next to him. He was numbered with the transgressors. Jesus would intercede for those who crucified him, Isaiah 53, verse 12. Judas would uh, regret his actions in the... Uh, and the pieces of civil will be thrown into the sanctuary, Zechariah eleven thirteen. 
There's a lot here. The betrayal money would buy a potter's field. Zechariah. It was prophesied in Zechariah. So you, you go through all of these and you go, how can they? All? Just the fulfillment of one of these is like 10 trillion, zillion to the, to the, to the power. It's like it's impossible. But all of these came to pass. How can you be skeptical after reading something like that? Okay. Judas would uh, regret his actions. Okay, I read that. The betrayal money was in the potter's field. There would be darkness over the whole land. Amos, verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 9. Jesus would be buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53, 9. Jesus' side would be pierced, Zechariah 12, 10. Then in the book of Psalms. Uh, let's, let's see, is that the one? Did I get both of these? Let me see. Oh, wait a minute. I got the wrong one. Hold on. Okay, here we go. The children uh, would sing Hosanna. Psalm 118, verse 25 and 26. The children would pro proclaim praise. Psalm verse eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. Jesus would be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41, verse 9. Come on. Okay. Jesus would be condemned by false witnesses. before the actual thing took place. Okay, Jesus would be hated with a cause, without a cause, Psalm 35. Jesus would be mocked, Psalm 22. Jesus would thirst on the cross, Psalm 69. Jesus would be offered gal, uh, gal, uh, sorry, gal and vinegar to drink, Psalm 69. Jesus' garments would be divided by the casting of lots. I'm showing you the Christocentric principle throughout the scriptures. Uh, Jesus would be would be reviled. Jesus would would be looked up by his relatives from afar. People would wag their heads at Jesus. <laughs> they did that, didn't they? When they saw him on the cross, they wagged their heads and said, "If thou be the Son of God, come down from there." <sighs> Jesus would be indicted for trusting in God. Psalm 22. Jesus would be pierced in his hands and his feet. Psalm 22. Jesus would cry out because of his uh, forsakenness. Psalm 22. Jesus would commit his spirit to the Father. Psalm 31. And Jesus' bones would not be broken. And that was in Exodus 12:46. Uh, Psalm 34:20. Did those things happen? Did all were all of them fulfilled? So what does that tell you? The preponderance of the evidence, even in a court of law, they don't go, they don't tell you, you convict somebody. If you absolutely positively know, it's by the preponderance of the evidence. You know, by reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt. It doesn't have to be 100%. It's a cumulative of all the, all of the, the evidence. All together. You take this all together, and you logically you have to com come to the conclusion that Jesus is who he said he was. Come on now. Now, so how, anybody want to copy this? Okay. All right. Um, Joe, why don't you hand them out for me? Okay. Now, just give one to everyone, one per family, so that way we have one. None for Linda. And I have mine up here. I made ten copies. I figured, I didn't think everybody would be here. So, okay, yeah, okay. So, uh, if you need a copy, I can get you a copy. No sweat, no problem. Okay. How is Christ seen in the scriptures? He is seen as the subject of the book of Genesis. In Genesis, Christ is seen in the following: as the tree of life. Amen. When you partake of Him, you will live forever. As Adam. You know the first Adam and the second Adam. Romans talks about that. 
uh, the seed of the woman. It talks about that in Genesis, and it talks about that in Matthew. Okay, the, the coats of skin, Genesis 3 and Romans 5. Jesus and his shed blood became our covering so that we could stand before God, clothed in his righteousness and, his righteousness and escape judgment. So all of these things are the principles by which we interpret the scriptures and properly. <clears throat> um, let me see. One, hold on. Uh, he was also the curse bearer, right? Remember when um, uh, Adam and Eve fell and God went to Adam and said, curse be the ground? Well, guess what? Christ became a curse for us, and he lifted that curse from us. So employment should not be a drag. Okay, as a Christian, you should be thankful that you have increase. You should be thankful that God got you a job, okay? And then you bless God with the first fruits of, the, of your labor. Amen? I mean, I could tell you story after story after story after story after story after story of God's blessing, and so could you. Of when you tithe and you give, you give of your tithe, your first fruits to God, uh, give everything to God that he asks for financially. That's one of the hardest things for people to do, but you know what? When you do that, God blesses you. He really, really does. He blesses you, and he blesses you with good things. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above, okay? And uh, I'll tell you, there's nothing like it. So uh, he, um, he's a curse bearer. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, Galatians chapter 3 says, having become a curse for us, for it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Do you understand? See, <clears throat> this is the thing. When you read the scriptures, don't just read it as a history. Read it as words of life, because when you see what Christ has done for you, there's nothing you won't do for him. God says, give this up. Don't do this anymore. Don't go the way of the world. Don't, don't follow your friends. Don't do that. And instead of fighting God you know, and, and, and things like that, you just say, okay, God, you got something better for me. Amen. You know, uh, you know, I want to go in this direction. No, don't do that. Well, I want to marry this person. Don't do that. God says, no, don't do it. He's got something better. Amen? So we'll see the two. You'll see the curse and then Christ redeeming us, uh, Christ's relationship to the curse. Okay? The ground was cursed and Christ became a curse. You know, you'd eat in sorrow under the curse. Christ was, uh, was a man of sorrows. Thorns and thistles, Christ was crowned with thorns. The sweat of, the, the sweat of man, Christ uh, sweat of drops of blood. The return to the dust, Christ brought, a, a, brought, the, a, a, Christ brought to dust of death. A flaming sword, Christ was pierced with a sword. Men to die, Christ tasted death for every man. Cut off from the tree of life, Christ is the tree of life. In John, we see that. He said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, right, you shall have everlasting life. Okay. Then we see the, uh, in Isaac, Isaac was the only begotten son of the Old Testament who was symbolically offered up by the exalted father as a sacrifice to God and symbolically raised again to life. That's speaking of Christ. So all of these examples are there. The lamb in the thicket, I'm just kind of going really Quick, so I'm trying to finish. Um, uh, Jacob's ladder. Uh, Joseph. How many have ever, ever read about Joseph? You read about Joseph. Go in and read about Joseph, not Joseph Fabio. Go read about Joseph in the Bible. Okay, read about Joseph in the Bible, and you see his life. It's very, very similar. Okay. Um, Christ is seen in the rest of the Pentateuch as a deliverer, a mediator, a lawgiver, in the light, as seen in the life of Moses. He is fulfilled, he's the fulfillment of the Anaronic priesthood. He is a fulfillment of the tabernacle types. He is a fulfillment of the five Levitical offerings. 
He is the smitten rock. He is the manna from heaven. He is the fulfillment of the feasts of Israel. See, that's why we don't have to celebrate the feasts. You know, that's why some of the New Testament churches today, they wear the, they wear the yarmulke, you know, they wear the shawls and all this stuff, and they got all kinds of uh, Israeli stuff on their platform. And I know they want to support Israel, and that's fine. But you know what? They don't have to do those things. Okay, Christ is the fulfillment of all of those things. He's the fulfillment of all the feasts. I don't have to do Passover feast anymore. I don't have to do the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I don't have to do any of those anymore because Christ is those things now. Okay? <clears throat> Christ is seen in the historical, historical... I'm sorry. Christ is seen in the historical books also. He is our Joshua. He is the captain of the Lord of hosts. He is our judge, our deliverer. He is the angel of the Lord. He is our Boaz, near kingsman. He is our king. He is our shepherd. He is our Nehemiah restorer. All of those things. Amen. He is seen in the Psalms, in the prophets, in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, epistles, book of Revelation. There are several steps in the process of applying this particular principle. Number one, decide if there are any Christocentric aspects to the verse in question. So if you read a scripture, you say, gee, is, is that somehow talking about Christ? Do that. Every single verse of the Bible cannot be directly linked to Christ. You'll find scriptures that are not related to him. When Jesus, when, when the word says that the devil went out and he spoke these words, well, that has nothing to do with Christ. Okay, so there are certain scriptures that don't have anything to do with Christ. Every single verse of the Bible cannot be directly linked to Christ. However, there are many portions that can be, and it is important not to try to make something fit when it does not really fit at all. Look for the specific features in the text that is seen to point to Christ. If you are in the Old Testament, is there a clear reference to the one who was to come, the Messiah? You can see De Deuteronomy 18, 15, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. These are probably all in your book. Okay, uh, Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is that talking about? And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Okay, That's to come in the millennial king, the millennial reign. Anybody familiar with the millennial reign of Christ? Who knows about the Raise your hand if you know about the millennial reign. Okay, just a few of you. We had that when we talked about the rapture and, and the end times and eschatology. We, we talked all about that. When Christ comes a second time after he comes back to the earth, he's going to establish righteousness. He's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. Satan's going to be bound for a thousand years. And just think, people will be born. Okay? The devil will be bound, but still people will not choose God. Isn't that something? People are going to go through the tribulation period. Some will be alive. Okay? Some will be alive. The ones that receive the mark will not. Okay? But during the millennial kingdom, there's going to be a thousand years. People are going to be born then. And there's going to be new generations that come, from out, come forth out of that. And, and, and some of those generations will not receive Christ. That's, that's amazing. <clears throat> okay. If you are in the Old Testament and there's a New Testament reference that confirms the symbolic application of Christ, look for that. Nevertheless, uh, if you look at Romans 5.14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. So we see that Jesus was a type of Adam. First Adam failed God. The second Adam, Christ, was successful in obeying God. Okay? Adam, when he sinned, died. Christ, when he died, he brought forth life. Amen? So you can see that in the scriptures. And when Israel was a child, he says, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called him. Hosea 11.1. 1. Now, who's that talking about? When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Hosea 11, verse 1.
If you only read this in Hosea, you might never apply it to the Messiah. Okay? But when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. What happened when Herod decided he wanted to kill all the babies two years old and under? Where did, where did um, Mary and Joseph take Jesus? To Egypt. Okay? And he says, I have called, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. It's talking about the Messiah. Remember, the New Testament writers became the infallible interpreters of the Old Testament prophets. Always remember that. Be careful not to extend parallels beyond the clear meaning of the rest of the scripture. Make sure you don't do that. Sometimes you can try to stretch something to mean something, and a lot of people do that, and then they fall into error because they say a scripture means something and it has no intentional meaning of that that they're trying to convey. Um, I think I told you this one time, uh, this lady, she said, um, she told her pastor, this is a true story, she told her pastor, she says, I'm divorcing my husband. And he said, well, why? She says, because I found a new one. And he said, and what scripture do you have to back that up? She said, oh, the scripture says I'm, I'm, I'm taking away the old to establish the new. And it's talking about the covenants. It's not talking about a new husband. Okay? But see how you can misinterpret the scripture and make it say what you want it to say for the situation you're in. You know, he takes away the first to establish the second. That's what the scripture says. And that's not concerning your husband or your wife. Okay? But see, you can get into so much trouble misinterpreting the word. That's why you need to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. I think we've got about four more lessons, maybe, on hermeneutics. And then I'm going to give you an assignment. And your assignment is going to be to interpret the entire book of Matthew. Verse, chapter by chapter. I'll make it easier for you. Chapter by chapter. Okay. And I want you to put your comments down. Now, let's say uh, there's 24 chapters. I'll give you two years. Okay. So you can do one chapter a month. That's pretty fair, right? Okay. I think, well, there might be 28 chapters, so whatever. But do a chapter a month and just go through it and, and assign it to where it belongs, to who it's speaking to and all this stuff. You'll be amazed because there's so many people that are making the book of Matthew say things to promote their doctrinal positions, <clears throat> especially when it comes to eschatology, when it has absolutely nothing to do with that. You heard me say many times, when, the, when you see these things happen, flee to Judea. Does that mean everybody in the United States is going to get on a plane and go to Judea? No. Because he was talking to a specific person, people at a specific time. Okay, You've got to remember those elements when interpreting Scripture. Amen? Is that being helpful? Do we have any questions? You've got to have some questions. No questions. You bunch of know-it-alls, I'm telling you. Yes, Darren. 